Louder. Louder. <clears throat> Louder. <laughs> That's uh, not the theme song from Excedrin Headache number 438. Uh, that is uh, a brief but typically painful passage from Igor Stravinsky's Rite of Spring. Uh, this piece of music was, for all intents and purposes, the theme song or national anthem of the Congress for Cultural Freedom. Uh, in 1952, the centerpiece of a month-long cultural festival in Paris, France, which was the kickoff organizing event of the Congress for Cultural Freedom, centered around a massively built up and advertised performance of this piece of trash by Igor Stravinsky, <clears throat> and we'll, over the course of this panel discussion, find out probably a good deal more about Stravinsky and come to understand why Theodore Adorno of the Frankfurt School uh, boasted that Stravinsky's music induces various forms of psychosis, including ultimately necrophilia. Now, it's a particularly insulting phenomenon that this kind of music, uh, particularly the uh, part of the third movement, that loud uh, headache tone that you heard a moment ago, uh, should be played in Europe by Americans immediately after World War II. Frankly, the music sounds like scenes from the uh, firebombing of Dresden or the uh, continual aerial bombardment of London during the Battle of Britain. So it was a particularly hideous image for Europeans to experience this kind of hideous noise being presented as the sort of anthem of the new post-war culture of so-called freedom and democracy coming from the United States. Now, I think the key question that I want to take up today is how is it possible just a few short years after the death of Franklin Roosevelt that this kind of hideous noise and the underlying philosophy behind it could be being presented as a cornerstone of American foreign policy towards Europe. I think that this gives you an idea, much more so than descriptive words, uh, of the dramatic cultural paradigm shift that occurred in the United States and internationally with the unexpected, sudden, tragic death of Franklin Roosevelt on April 12, 1945. Now, uh, Elizabeth Nash asked a question uh, yesterday during the uh, internal meeting of Lynn, and uh, Lynn answered it in broad philosophical terms. I'm going to take a much more direct stab at that question now, because uh, put yourself in the position of Lyndon LaRouche uh, at the moment that he learned of the death of Franklin Roosevelt. <clears throat> At the time, Lynn was 22 years old. He was overseas in a very distant corner of the planet. I don't know whether he was uh, already back in India or was uh, 
traipsing around with military units somewhere in Burma at the moment. But Lynn described on a number of recent occasions that when people learned about Roosevelt's death, these young GIs, many of them just right off of the farm, came to him because they knew that Lynn, even back then, was somebody who stood intellectually heads and shoulders above most of the other people around them. And they went to him and they said, what's the meaning of Roosevelt's death? And Lynn quite honestly said, I, I can't tell you in detail, <clears throat> but I know it's going to be really bad. The consequences of Roosevelt's unexpected sudden death are going to be very bad. Um, now, bear in mind that Roosevelt was inaugurated as President of the United States in March of 1932. Lynn was 10 years old at the time, six months or seven months away from his 11th birthday. And so for the whole World War II generation, Lynn's generation, they virtually spent their entire lives from the time that they were pre-teenagers living under the presidential leadership of Franklin Roosevelt. He'd already been president for 12 years in 1945. And he had just recently been reelected to an unprecedented fourth term in office. And there was a new vice president, Harry Truman, who was not a very inspiring or talented individual, to say the least. He was basically a local political hack. Uh, he had been installed as vice president because Roosevelt's enemies within the Democratic Party had moved to prevent Henry Wallace, who had been Roosevelt's vice president in the 1940 campaign, from continuing in office. Because uh, Wallace, by and large, was a loyal follower of the policies and spirit of Franklin Roosevelt. And Roosevelt's enemies were preparing for what they hoped would be Roosevelt's early death, so that they would be in a position to immediately move to seize power and radically change the direction of American politics. And that's exactly what happened. But I want to give you a certain flavor for the Roosevelt political leadership largely in his own words, so that you get an idea, as people in Lynn's generation did, of the qualities of leadership that Roosevelt represented. And therefore, you can understand why it is that the experiences that Lynn's generation went through represented the same kind of shock trauma that the baby boomer generation would go through in the 1960s, leading to the disaster known as the drug, rock, sex, counterculture, and everything that's followed from that. In fact, there were two profoundly tra traumatic events that occurred in very rapid succession before Lynn celebrated his 23rd birthday. First was the death of Franklin Roosevelt and the accession to power of this little man, Harry Truman, who from day one was virtually a pawn in the hands of Winston Churchill and Roosevelt's enemies, his erstwhile wartime allies, but in fact, his profound philosophical and political enemies. The second event was the dropping of the atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki beginning an era of psychological terror and the continuous fear that the human race would now destroy itself through the use of nuclear bombs. And that happened in, I forget the exact date, late August, early September of 1945. Had Roosevelt been president, the war would have ended in the Pacific with a Japanese surrender without ever using these horrific weapons, without the mass murders that took place of a civilian population in two Japanese cities, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
We don't have time to go here this morning through the details of that, but suffice it to say that we know from eyewitnesses who were directly involved with Roosevelt in secret diplomacy through the Vatican with the Emperor of Japan, that Japan had already been defeated, and it was only a short matter of time before certain factions within the Japanese military accepted that reality and agreed to go along with the terms of surrender that had already been negotiated through secret channels between Roosevelt and the Emperor of Japan. Now, Franklin Roosevelt represented a unique form of American leadership. And in fact, he was a rather, in some respects, unlikely president to oversee a revolutionary return to the principles of the American system. But Roosevelt went through his own personal traumatic experience. During most of the 1920s, Roosevelt was forced to drop out of politics and dedicate his every waking hour to battling a severe case of polio. And to gain a certain intellectual courage and strength to endure that effort, Roosevelt embarked on a kind of in-depth study beginning with his own family's genealogy, tracing back to the founding days of the American Republic, where his own great-grandfather had been one of the closest collaborators of Alexander Hamilton in founding the first national bank and in founding the Bank of New York. So through his own family, Roosevelt plunged into a study of the American system. He had actually written his graduate uh, dissertation from Harvard University on Alexander Hamilton. So he was already aware of this tradition. And, but he conducted an in-depth study uh, throughout the 1920s until he was well enough in the mid-1920s to run for governor of New York and to prepare himself eventually for the 1932 presidential elections. Now, Roosevelt's sort of inaugural political address uh, was an article that he wrote for, of all publications, Foreign Affairs, the journal of the New York Council on Foreign Relations. And he must have appreciated the irony that it was in the journal Foreign Affairs that he wrote an article in July 1928 called A Democratic View of Our Foreign Policy. Um, we're uh, happy this morning to have Robert Beltran here with us, uh, who's going to read some of the excerpts from Roosevelt that I've chosen uh, to go through this morning. So I'd like Robert to come up and read a brief section from that 1928 uh, essay. Oh, that's me. Okay. Is starting there and then ending there. Oh, okay. Roosevelt concluded his essay in the present tense. The time has come when we must accept n not only certain facts, but many new principles of a higher law, a newer and better standard in international relations. We are exceedingly jealous of our own sovereignty, and it is only right that we should respect a similar feeling among other nations. The peoples of the other republics of this Western world are just as patriotic, just as proud of their sovereignty. Many of these nations are large, wealthy, and highly civilized. The peace, the security, the integrity, the independence of every one of the American republics is of interest to all the others, not to the United States alone. Single-handed intervention by us in the internal affairs of other nations must end. With the cooperation of others, we shall have more order in this hemisphere and less dislike. The time is ripe to start another chapter. On that new page, there is much that should be written in the spirit of our forebears. If the leadership is right, or more truly, if the spirit behind it is great, 
the United States can regain the world's trust and friendship and be, uh, become again of service. We can point the way once more to the reducing of armaments. We can cooperate officially and wholeheartedly with every agency that studies and works to relieve the common ills of mankind. And we can, for all time, renounce the practice of arbitrary intervention in the home affairs of our neighbors. So Roosevelt stated a foreign policy intent with this 1928 essay in Foreign Affairs. Um, and he was a man of his word. Uh, one of the very first things that he did upon being inaugurated as President of the United States on March 4th, 1933, was to announce the good neighbor policy which was to be the implementation of these principles, this revival of the American foreign policy outlook best expressed in the past by John Quincy Adams. And in fact, even though he was in the midst of confronting the Great Depression and had declared a bank holiday and was in the process of carrying out a bankruptcy reorganization of the American banking system as one of his first acts of, as president, uh, Roosevelt arranged on April 12, 1933, to deliver a speech that was broadcast simultaneously throughout the Western Hemisphere, further continuing the ideas of his foreign policy within the relations among the nations of the Western Hemisphere. These are a few brief excerpts from the address that he delivered on April 12, 1933. Here and up to there. Common ideals and a community of interest, together with a spirit of cooperation, have led to the realization that the well-being of one nation depends in large measure upon the well-being of its neighbors. Friendship among nations, as among individuals, calls for the constructive efforts to muster the forces of humanity in order that an atmosphere of close understanding and cooperation must be cultivated. In this spirit, the people of every republic on our continent are coming to deep understanding of the fact that the Monroe Doctrine, of which so much has been written and spoken for more than a century, was and is directed at the maintenance of independence by the peoples of the continent. It was aimed and is aimed against the acquisition in any manner of the control of additional territory in this hemisphere by any non-American power. Each one of us must grow by an advancement of civilization and social well-being and not by the acquisition of territory at the expense of any neighbor. Now, Roosevelt was very conscious that American foreign policy in the tradition of the Founding Fathers was driven by the principle of agape, particularly as it was discussed in 1 Corinthians 13. And he was very explicit about this, particularly in uh, a speech that he delivered at the Democratic Nominating Convention on June 27th, 1936. Now, compare, if you will, the words you're about to hear from Franklin Roosevelt with the uh, circus atmosphere that we ran into up in Boston and that has been generally the characteristic of the Democratic and Republican parties for the recent decades since the cultural paradigm shift that we're discussing today. So have that in the back of your mind as you hear Roosevelt's invoking of the cornerstone policies of what he proposed to be his second term in office as President of the United States. <clears throat> 
It has been brought home to us that the only effective guide for safety in this most worldly, worldly of worlds, the greatest guide of all is moral principle. We do not see faith, hope, and charity as unobtainable ideals, but we use them as stout supports of a nation fighting the fight for freedom in modern civilization. Faith in the soundness of democracy in the midst of dictatorships. Hope renewed because we know so well the progress we have made. Charity, in the true spirit of that grand old word. For charity, literally translated, means love. Love that understands, that does not merely share the wealth of the giver, but in true sympathy and wisdom helps men to help themselves. We seek not merely to make a government, to make government a mechanical implement, but to give it a vibrant personal character that is very much the embodiment of human charity. In the place of privilege, we seek to build a temple out of faith, hope, and charity. Governments can err, presidents make mistakes, but the immortal Dante tells us that divine justice weighs the sins of the cold-blooded and the sins of the warm-hearted on different scales. So once, you, once again, you get the idea uh, that you're dealing with a certain profundity of leadership in Roosevelt. Uh, hopefully people got somewhat of a sense from the morning panel on Sunday of the great projects that Roosevelt launched as the cornerstone of his plan for domestic economic recovery. so that this was not merely a president who was capable of delivering fancy words or profound ideas devoid of real content. He was absolutely dedicated to the concept that the United States would restore its role in the world and that the mission of the United States, after having taken the leading role in recovering from a depression at home and having defeated fascism overseas, would be to continue the process of the spread of the ideas of the American Revolution. Roosevelt's concept was that the United States, stepping onto the stage of world leadership at the end of the Second World War, would lead the process of decolonization and economic recovery on a global scale. So that the death of Roosevelt, the accession of Truman, the launching of the Cold War with Winston Churchill's speech in Fulton, Missouri in 1946 represented a profound overturning of every fundamental principle that Roosevelt had stood for and had fought for during his presidency. And this was something that was profoundly understood by everyone in Lynn's generation coming back from World War II. Now, Roosevelt's son, Elliot, was uh, one of his closest wartime confidants. Uh, he was the first in the family to volunteer for military service before the outbreak of the war, something that FDR was quite proud of. And whenever he was able to do it, when Roosevelt was traveling overseas to attend major international conferences with Churchill, Stalin, other world leaders, he tried to arrange it that his son Elliot could be traveling with him as his personal adjutant so that they were able to have a great deal of private discussion at the end of the day. And Elliot Roosevelt made his own profound political intervention with the writing and publication of his book, As He Saw It, uh, which was published in 1946. Probably many of you have seen the book. I'm sure there are copies floating around both here on the West Coast and back East. Um, Roosevelt, Elliot Roosevelt wrote this book because he already understood that the shift from Roosevelt to Truman represented a coup 
against virtually everything that his father had stood for during his 12 years as president. In the preface to the book, Eliot wrote, the decision to write this book was taken recently and impelled by urgent events. Winston Churchill's speech at Fulton, Missouri had a hand in this decision. All the signs of growing disunity among the leading nations of the world, all the broken promises, all the renascent power politics of greedy and desperate imperialism were my spurs in this undertaking. The unity that won the war should be, must be, in fact today, if we are to win the peace. But more and more since VE Day and since the atom bomb first fell, this unity has disappeared. It is because I doubt that we have only drifted away from this unity. It is because I am convinced that we are being shoved away from it by men who should know better that I feel it important for me to write this book. I am writing this then to you who agree with me that Franklin Roosevelt's ideal and statesmanship would have been sufficient to keep that unity a vital entity during the post-war period and who agree with me that the path he charted has been most grievous, grievously and desperately forsaken. So this is literally a year after his father's death. And with the Truman presidency, with the launching of the Cold War through the Iron Curtain speech by Churchill, and especially by the dropping of the atomic bombs, all of the great prospects for the world that had been in Roosevelt's mind were dashed. And Eliot used the book to give a clear sense of what was the profound difference, the profound policy dispute between Roosevelt and Churchill. And to make it clear that had Roosevelt survived, Britain would not have even dared to think about reviving its post-World War II imperial ambitions. Here's a sample from Elliot Roosevelt's description of the very first summit meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill that took place in August 1941 at Argentia in Newfoundland. Now, whenever Roosevelt traveled, by the way, be, be aware that this was not a matter of jumping on Air Force One and being halfway around the world in a matter of hours. Uh, when Roosevelt traveled, as he did throughout the war, to various locations for summit meetings with world leaders, he had to travel by ship, by naval vessels, and an entire flotilla of ships had to travel with him for security reasons. This was an ongoing war. There were German, Japanese submarines in the waters. It was a dangerous effort, and it was time consuming. Roosevelt would be away for weeks and months at a time. He was in Tehran. He was in Casablanca in North Africa. He was in Yalta in the Crimea for these crucial wartime summits. But the description by Elliot Roosevelt of the very first face-to-face -face meeting between Roosevelt and Churchill, I think really uh, clearly defines Roosevelt's mission as president to bring a permanent end to European colonialism and imperialism. This is Elliot Roosevelt's description. Uh, this is Elliot describing his father, private discussion with him just before the summit meeting with uh, Churchill. I think I speak as America's president when I say that America won't help England in this war simply so that she will be able to continue to ride roughshod over colonial peoples. Uh, the next day, Elliot wrote, when Roosevelt sat down with Churchill, he was no less blunt than he was in his private discussions with his son. And this is what he said to Churchill. I am firmly of the belief that if we are to arrive at a stable peace, it must involve the development of backward countries, backward peoples. How can this be done? It can't be done, obviously, by 18th century methods. At which point, Eliot, who was in the room, said that Churchill turned beet red and interrupted. Who's talking 18th century methods? 
Roosevelt, whichever of your ministers recommends a policy which takes wealth in raw materials out of a colonial country, but which returns nothing to the people of that country in consideration. 20th century methods involve bringing industry to these colonies. 20th century methods include increasing the wealth of a people by increasing their standard of living, by educating them, by bringing sanitation, by making sure that they get a return for the raw wealth of their community. And then Eliot observed, the prime minister himself was beginning to look apoplectic. You mention India, Churchill growled, FDR. Yes, I can't believe that we can fight a war against fascist slavery and at the same time not work to free people all over the world from a backward colonial policy. And this was characteristic of Roosevelt in all of his dealings with Churchill. Roosevelt traveled at one point later during the war to Tehran, the capital of Iran. And uh, again, Elliot Roosevelt was with him. Uh, Robert, maybe you could read this section here. Um, <clears throat> this is Elliot again describing the discussions with the young Shah of Iran. As ever, father was interested in finding out more about the country and in probing around for ideas that would help to solve its problems. He and the Iranian officials discussed the barren desert which made up such a great part of the country. They told him how, in centuries past, their land had been heavily wooded and told of how it had become a dust bowl. This was a familiar subject to father. Warming up, he raised the question of a gigantic reforestation program shifted from there to the plight of the majority of the Shah's subjects, tied the two things together, and was at length drawn by his vis visitors to a consideration of the economic grip which Britain had on Iran's oil wells and mineral deposits. Father nodded sympathetically and agreed that steps should be taken to safeguard Iran's natural wealth. Right after the meeting with the Shah ended, <coughs> Roosevelt um, instructed his son Elliot. He said, go find Pat Hurley, who was one of Roosevelt's key advisors, and tell him to get to work drawing up a draft memorandum guaranteeing Iran's independence and her self-determination of her economic interests, an agreement from the Russians and the British guaranteeing Iranian sovereignty and political independence. It should be a good example of what we'll be able to accomplish later on. So he was not a man, not only a man of these universal principles, which were the guiding principles of the American Revolution, but being the President of the United States, for the first time in the history of our nation, when we actually had the power as a leading world power to see these ideas through to implementation, Roosevelt didn't skip a beat. He used every opportunity, every situation. In the book, Elliot Roosevelt describes many other instances where his father would be in Africa or in other parts of the colonial world that had been dominated by Britain and continental European oligarchies for decades and centuries. And in every instance, his vision, very much reminiscent of the way Lynn travels around the world, was how can we put the most profound scientific ideas to work? How can we create true nations of true sovereign peoples? And these principles obviously imbued everything that Roosevelt did on behalf of the American people. I want to conclude by asking Robert to come up and read uh, again excerpts from a 1932 radio address that Roosevelt delivered. This was before he had the Democratic Party presidential nomination and obviously before he was elected president. But this is the speech in which he invoked the forgotten man and made it clear that his presidency would be dedicated to bringing the forgotten man back into the mainstream of American politics. 
Although I understand that I am talking under the auspices of the Democratic National Committee, I do not want to limit myself to politics. I do not want to feel that I am addressing an audience of Democrats or that I merely speak as a Democrat myself. The present condition of our national affairs is too serious to be viewed through partisan eyes for partisan purposes. Fifteen years ago, my public duty called me to an active part in a great national emergency, the World War. Success then was due to a leadership whose vision carried beyond the timorous and futile gesture of sending a tiny army of 150,000 trained soldiers and the regular Navy to the aid of our allies. The generalship of that moment conceived of a whole nation mobilized for war, economic, industrial, social, and military resources gathered into a vast unit capable of, and actually in the process of, throwing into the scales 10 million men equipped with physical needs and sustained by the realization that behind them were the united efforts of 110 million human beings. It was a great plan because it was built from bottom to top and not from top to bottom. In my calm judgment, the nation faces today a more grave emergency than in 1917. It is said that Napoleon lost the Battle of Waterloo because he forgot his infantry. He staked too much upon the more spectacular but less substantial cavalry. The present administration in Washington provides a close parallel. It has either forgotten or it does not want to remember the infantry of our economic army. These unhappy times call for the building of plans that rest upon the forgotten, the unorganized, but the indispensable units of economic power, for plans like those of 1917 that build from the bottom up and not from the top down, that put their faith once more in the forgotten man at the bottom of the economic pyramid. Obviously, these few minutes tonight permit no opportunity to lay down the 10 or dozen closely related objectives of a plan to meet our present emergency, but I can draw a few essentials, a beginning, in fact, of a planned program. It is the habit of the unthinking to turn in times like this to the illusions of economic magic. People suggest that a huge expenditure of public funds by the federal government and by state and local governments will completely solve the unemployment problem. But it is clear that even if we could raise many billions of dollars and find definitely useful public works to spend these billions on, even all that money would not give employment to the 7 million or 10 million people who are out of work. Let us admit frankly that it would be only a stopgap. A real economic cure must go to the killing of the bacteria in the system rather than to the treatment of external symptoms. How much do the shallow thinkers realize, for example, that approximately one half of our whole population 50 or 60 million people earn their living by farming or in small towns whose existence immediately depends on farms. They have today lost their purchasing power. Why? They are receiving for farm products less than the cost to them of growing these farm products. The result of this loss of purchasing power is that many other millions of people engaged in industry in the cities cannot sell industrial products to the farming half of the nation. This brings home to every, citizen, every city worker that his own employment is directly tied up with the farmer's dollar. No nation can long endure half bankrupt. Main Street, Broadway, the mills, the mines will close if half the buyers are broke. I cannot escape the conclusion that one of the essential parts of a national program of restoration must be to restore purchasing power to the farming half of the country. Without this, the wheels of railroads and of factories will not turn. Closely associated with this first objective is the problem of keeping the homeowner and the farm owner where he is without being dispossessed through the foreclosure of his mortgage. His relationship to the great banks of Chicago and New York is pretty remote. The $2 billion fund which President Hoover and the Congress have put at the disposal of the big banks the railroads, and the corporation of the nation is not for him. His is a relationship to his little local bank or local loan company. It is a sad fact that even though the local lender in many cases does not want to evict the farmer or homeowner by foreclosure proceedings, he is forced to do so in order to keep his bank or company solvent.
Here should be an objective of government itself, to provide at least as much assistance to the little fellow as it is now giving to the large banks and corporations. That is another example of building from the bottom up. All that ended on April 12, 1945, with Roosevelt's death and with the accession to power of Harry Truman, the pawn of Winston Churchill, and Bertrand Russell, and the British oligarchy. The American people, Lynn's generation, by and large, were left traumatized, frightened, and terrorized by the dropping of the atomic bombs several months later. Is there any question in your minds why it is that when the American GIs, the 22-year-olds, the 23-year-olds, came back from war, that their wives, their families, were living in abject terror, that the United States would crash once again back into a depression? Because the steady hand of moral leadership the intellectual compass that had been provided by Franklin Roosevelt was suddenly not there, and in its place was something thoroughly unprepared and unqualified to deal with the crises of the post-war world. Unfortunately, the British oligarchy, in the person of people like Churchill and even more profoundly of Bertrand Russell, were waiting in the wings, preparing to pounce the moment that Roosevelt was buried. Delante? Yep, here. <clears throat> All right. Um, so, as, you know, as, as Jeff went through uh, the question of the FDR revolution, um, it's obviously clear that when FDR died, it pretty much shattered the, the hearts and minds and souls of the American population. Uh, I actually remember when I was in D.C., I was organizing, and you know, I met this elderly lady who was you know, pretty much around Lynn's generation. And she, you know, she went through her hist a personal historical process of FDR through King through up to the present time. And she's, I mean, she stated, she said, uh, when FDR died, she said, we don't know what we're going to do, baby. We don't know what we're going to, what, what's next? And, uh, you know, she tried to, uh, you know, create a, a picture in my mind about the, what, the, the demoralization of the population at the time period. And it suddenly it clicked in my mind what, uh, what Jeff had brought up in terms of uh, uh, Lynn, when someone asked Lynn, what, what do you think about uh, the death of Roosevelt? And you say it's a bad thing, a very bad thing. So we want to hit on this question of what, what happened to Lynn's generation? What happened to the post-World War II generation? Why couldn't they carry on the, the political leadership that was fostered through Roosevelt? This elderly lady was, was unfortunately right, saying that they, the, the population just had no idea what, of what to do next. However, FDR's enemies, as you said earlier, was waiting literally in the bedside, his deathbed, with pre-established plans for destroying the developing nation state in which FDR was striving to continue in the tradition of the American Revolution. So you had, you know, you had Truman, who was plopped in as a presidential uh, and to the presidential seat, unqualified, incompetent of being president, and within months of becoming president, he dropped the only two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And as has as been asked before, why did this fool drop these bombs on a surrendering nation? What was his motive? Who, was, who or what was influencing Truman to act in this insane manner? So as Lynn said, uh, I think the other day, he said, well, you have to investigate the nature of the ocean that the fish are swimming in. And there, you know, there are several different characters that are playing in this game. I mean, I could go through a bunch of them, but 
I think one that is probably the most influential in the shadows of the policy making in, in the United States and Great Britain, uh, and you know, who was pretty much acting in the post war you know, post war to make the, the, the world safe or free, as he says, uh, for the for the synarchists to move in. So I want to focus on this guy, Bertrand Russell. Lord Bertrand, Arthur Williams Russell, the third Earl. And I asked earlier, I said, uh, well, you know, what is the motivation? What was the motivation that, of dropping these, these bombs on Japan? It obviously wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't cooked up in, in a few months as Truman was in presidency. Uh, and as we know, Roosevelt had really no intention whatsoever of dropping or creating any, any type of madness such as this one. In fact, this was a, this is a plot which had been promoted for decades preceding Roosevelt's presidency. And Russell, he clarified this publicly in his, in his contribution to a uh, one paper that I want to bring up. Uh, it's, it's called the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. This is written in October 1st, 1946. Uh, the title is The Atomic Bomb and the Prevention of War. And he goes through in detail of how he wants to create this, this terror on the, on the population. So one of the, yeah, uh, I think it's 28. Yeah. Ah, that's a lot. <laughs> uh, what do you say? This is, in, it's in, this is, this is again, in a letter. It's entirely clear that there is only one way in which great wars can be permanently prevented, and that, that is the establishment of an international government with a monopoly of series of armed forces. An international government, if it is to be able to pre reverse peace, must have the only atomic bombs, the only plant for produ producing them, the only air force, the only battlefields, and generally whatever is necessary to make it irresistible. The international government will have to, to decide all disputes between different nations and will have to possess the right to revise treaties. It will have to be bound by its constitution to intervene by force of arms against any nation that refuses to submit to the arbitration. Given its monopoly of armed force, such intervention will be seldom necessary and quickly successful. Sounds familiar <laughs> to today's. So in this, this uh, 1946 report, Russell, you know, he's, he states explicitly uh, that he wants to tra transform the recently established United Nations organization to the kind of one world dictatorship uh, for which the synarchists have the, you know, can continue throughout the 20th century. And later in the PC, he goes through the, the idea of, you know, terrifying nations, as again it says there, to submit to the brutal military forces using nuclear weapons. So who is this evil-like creature, Bertrand Russell, Lord Bertrand Russell, as Jeff was going through? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> that picture there. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, he's actually, he's the heir of, 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 to the title of Earl of Russell. I mean, he's an oligarch. You can keep it up. Make sure people get this in their dreams tonight. They dream about this guy here. Uh, he's actually the grandson of Lord John Russell, who, actually, who, who was the, the British Foreign Secretary during the Civil War, <clears throat> and he, you know, he helped to deploy British and French naval forces, who aided in the slavery for the Confederates in the United States and Abraham Lincoln's uh, presidency. So, uh, I have a, a true hatred uh, more. For this guy. His uh, his grandparents practically raised him uh, since his father, who was a good friend of John Stuart Mill whom they both learned to believe, you know, believe in this population control thing. Uh, 
they both died, along with, the, uh, with his mother and his father, died early in age. A majority of his childhood, he was homeschooled. He was actually introduced to some of the, you know, the classical, the classical thinkers, German, French, and English authors. But what happened to him? Lynn was actually introduced to these, you know, some of the greatest minds in history too. When did he actually change and make the, the, the actual sudden shift in becoming evil? What I want to do is actually uh, show you uh, something he, he wrote in his, his autobiography on how, yeah, I'm going to bring up one of my dirty birdies here. Uh, <laughs> and, to, to read a quote of how Bertrand shifted into this evil. <clears throat> At age 11, I began Euclid with my brother as my tutor. There was one of the great moments of my life, as dazzling as first love. I had not imagined that there was anything so delicious in the world. After I learned the fifth proposition, my brother told me that it was generally considered difficult, but I found no difficulty whatever. This was my first time it had dawned upon me that I might have some intelligence. <laughs> From that moment until Whitehead and I finished Principia Mathematica when I was 38, mathematics was my chief interest and my chief source of happiness. Like all happiness, however, it was not unallowed. I had been told that Euclid pr proved things and was much disappointed and started with, um, that he started with axioms. At first, I refused to accept them unless my brother could offer me some reason for doing so. But he said, if you don't accept them, we cannot go on. And I wished to go on. I reluctantly admitted them pro tem. The doubt as to the premises of mathematics, which I felt at that moment remain with me and determine the course of my subsequent work. Yes. Got him. That's it. So ever since then, you know, it's been hell for Russell. And you know, that generally kind of shifts into not just the, the fact that he you know, was studying Euclidean geometry, but the, the fact that he capitulated at this certain point, when his brother you know, told him to you know, go along with this. Now, you know, ironically, through, uh, throughout his adolescence, you know, Russell says in his autobiography again that you know, he was lonely and unhappy and he hated humanity and because he couldn't eat fruits and dry, uh, climb up trees and things of this nature. Uh, he, constantly contemplating suicide. In fact, he's, you know, he, was, he started to wrestle between his, his favorite interests of, of religion, sex, and, and, and mathematics, as if these, these three th things have something in common. I don't know. Uh, in fact, he, he really develops his, his, pervert, his perversiveness uh, at a very young age. Um, there's one, there's one biography written by, a, I forgot the guy's name, but he states that Russell's perverted mind is in direct correlation to his insane mathematical logic. And Russell also uh, brings this out in his autobiography of how he, he uh, you know, how he, he develops this, this, these, these fantasies about uh, people, women, and also, uh, uh, you know, in correlation to his math. And I think Russell wants to uh, share that with you too. Dirty bird number two. <laughs> oh dear. I do remember at 15, began to have sexual passions of almost intolerable intensity while I was sitting at work, endeavoring to concentrate, I'd be continually distracted by erections. <laughs> 
I fell into the practice of masturbating, in which, however, I was always remained moderate, much ashamed of this practice, and endeavored to discontinue it. <laughs> I persisted in it, nevertheless, until the age of 20, when I dropped it suddenly because I was in love. <laughs> the same tutor who told me of the approach of puberty mentioned some months later that one speaks of a man's breasts, but of a woman's breasts. We know why they, they call him Dirty Birdie, huh? <laughs> so <laughs> he, he, he goes and he in, enters in, into Cambridge, where he's indoctrinated to the backwardness of the 18th century of radical empiricists. He came deeply rooted into the methods of Galileo and Newton. Here he, he um, you know, he continues his, in, in, pretty much concretizes his ideology and his oligarchical stance around what they call the society, or they call themselves the apostles, shaping his uh, political and religious, scientific and philosophical views of the nature of man. These guys would sit around all day and you know, discuss how much they hated Leibniz and, and metaphysics, devising methods of how to destroy this idea of man being a creative being that can discover unseen universal principles. So his hatred for the past six centuries of European classical civilization permeates in his writings, especially his passion, hatred for his passionate hatred for the creative, noble, sovereign nation state. To give you kind of more of a sense of this Pavlovian Freudian method of brainwashing the society. Uh, and, and how he, he wanted to create a scientific dictatorship. I want you to listen to, again, uh, Russell's mission of how to go about this. Right. Dirty Bird, part three. <laughs> I think the subject which will be of most importance politically is mass psychology. Mass psychology is, scientifically speaking, not a very advanced study, and so far its professors have not been in universities. They have been advertisers, politicians, and above all, dictators. This study is immensely useful to practical men, whether they wish to become rich or to acquire the government. It is, of course, as a science, founded upon individual psychology. But hitherto, it has employed rule of thumb methods, which were based upon a kind of intuitive common sense. Its importance has been enormously increased by the growth of modern methods of propaganda. Of these, the most influential is what is called education. Religion plays a part, though a diminishing one, the press, the cinema, and the radio play an increasing part. What is essential in mass psychology is the art of persuasion. If you compare a speech of Hitler's with a speech of, say, Edmund Burke, you will see what strides have been made in the art since the 18th century. What went wrong formerly was that people had read in books that man is a rational animal and framed their arguments on this hypothesis. We now know that limelight and a brass band do more to persuade than can be done by the most elegant train of syllogisms. It may be hoped that in time, anybody will be able to persuade anybody of anything if he can catch the patient young and is provided by the state with money and equipment. This subject will make great strides when it is taken up by scientists under a scientific dictatorship. 
Anaxagoras maintained that snow is black, but no one believed him. The social psychologists of the future will have a number of classes of school children on whom they will try different methods of producing an unshakable conviction that snow is black. Various results will soon be arrived at. First, that the influence of home is obstructive. Second, that not much can be done unless indoctrination begins before the age of 10. Third, that verses set to music and repeatedly intoned are very effective. Fourth, that the opinion that snow is white must be held to show a morbid taste for eccentricity. But I anticipate. It is for future scientists to make these maxims precise and discover exactly how much it costs per head to make children believe that snow is black and how much less it would cost to make them believe it is dark gray. Hitler look like a saint in this case. I mean, they, now th these ideas actually, uh, they were shared by uh, others. So I think Jimmy brought up Orwell's and H.G. Wells, Huxley's and so on. These are the ideas that actually were, uh, took over a large section of the baby boomers, the rock drug sex counter, which created the rock drug sex counterculture and attributed to the followers of the Frankfurt School and more contemporary, the CCF. These are also the ideas that dominated the 20th century. And Russell and himself has labeled himself as really Satan. Okay. So what I want to do to close out, because I really want to get into the, the actual intention of Russell and his, his fallacy of understanding science, history, and man. I want you to pull up uh, his conclusion for creating his utopia. And this is also from his uh, 1951 book, which I encourage everyone to read, uh, The Impact of Science on Society. Is into the population, which occurred in the 20th century where you had massive amounts of new methods of communication through radio, through film, massive outpourings of, of the printing press, magazines, various different things. Um, and how, and I won't do no British ad. 